I wonder if you would with me tonight turn to the book of 1 Corinthians in chapter 12. And we're going to start reading from verse 12. I want to read two or three verses there, uh, starting with verse 12 in just a few minutes. If there's any way possible, uh, Sunday afternoon around 4 o'clock, I would love to meet with the Sunday school teachers. And uh, if y'all can be here, can you, if that's possible. I won't hold up much of y'all's time, okay? So uh, around 4 o'clock, if that's that good with y'all. We'll start from there, just the, the Sunday school teachers. I appreciate it uh, so much. Um, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. We serve a mighty God. Amen. I want to say this also, and uh, I can't speak for everyone. I can speak for myself. That Boy, I had a time Sunday. I went home. I just got in the car. I told my wife, I didn't know what words to use or to say. I just kept saying, this is a good day. <laughs> this is a good day. Oh, it was just so good. It was just such a um, great feeling to be in the house of the Lord. Uh, I want to say this. Uh, great feeling to be in, a, in, the, in that presence of the Lord with fellow believers. There's nothing like that. There's nothing like uh, being assembled together in a corporate body of believers in worshiping. There's just something special about that. I was in a conversation Monday, sitting on the phone, and I was, matter of fact, it come up over that just about Sunday when you're in, this, in a corporate body, just a body of believers worshiping. And I said, it's just a special presence there. Just something you just, man, it's just hard to describe it. And I, I made the comment. I said, you know, you can watch something on uh, social media, on TV, and you can watch that. And I brought up this scenario, really not even knowing what was going on at the time. And some of y'all know a man by the name of Jim Contori with the Weather Channel. And probably if you've kept up, I don't watch much of this, but I have in the past that you can watch Jim Contori as he comes in and the wind starts to blow his hair and it's blowing his jacket and you can see trees blowing. You can sit there and watch it on the TV. But I tell you what you can't do. You can't feel the wind. <laughs> I said, you can watch the wind blow, but you can't feel the wind. It's just something about being uh, in a place, corporate body, in the house of God. Amen. Amen. In the book of, Ma in the book of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians in chapter 12, and I want to read two verses this afternoon to you, or maybe make that 3, 12, 13. And 14. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that body one, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit we are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have all been made to drink of the same, of the, into the one Spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for this afternoon, and for thank you, Lord, for being able to assemble together, Lord, and be able to declare and proclaim your word. We pray, Lord, for the mighty movement of the Holy Spirit. Lord, let your anointing rest upon us this afternoon. Uh, let it be upon us, Lord, as we preach your word. We ask God for our ears to be very, to be open, to be very alert and attentive, Lord, to your word. I pray, God, for the ones that are here, for the ones who are listening to us on uh, some other social platform, Lord. May the Spirit of God minister, Lord, here in a mighty way. Thank you, Lord. We magnify you, Lord. Oh, Holy Spirit, move in this house tonight. Come upon us, Lord. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. I want to say here that 
in the book of Acts in Pentecost, something very uh, magnificent happened. We see at Pentecost an outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon believers and God doing mighty things in their life. You can go back and read this in the book of Acts. You can start with the very first chapter, but you can go all the way through. And you're going to find out that the Spirit of God was using people to expand the kingdom of God. And before I get started into this, God's way of doing things have not changed. When he does things in the earth, in this earth that we're in, pertaining to the kingdom of God, he uses people like me and you. He uses what we call the body, and we refer to it as the body of, of Christ. Some refer to it as the church, which is the body of Christ, which is the redeemed of the Lord. So what God is doing, God is going to use me or you. He's going to use someone to bring about his purpose. We also find out when we go back to the book of Acts, we find out with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that God took, if we could use this word, God took feeble men. Or just say, not just men, God took feeble man and his failures and all of his issues that he had and he poured his spirit into man. And it was there that, God, that man became the vessel which God was using to bring about the gospel, the message, the word of God, and to expand the kingdom of God. He's still doing the same thing today. Let me stress this. He is still doing the same thing today. I want to say this. You have purpose. And I pray that through the help of the Holy Spirit, when we're through with this message, that you're going to understand just the purpose. You're going to understand how important the purpose is that you have concerning the kingdom of God. You have purpose. You are very important. There is a gift and a calling that is within you. We understand this from going back and just studying the book of Corinthians that the Holy Spirit, that the Spirit of God has gifted every man. Not all giftings are the same, but He's gifted every person. In some form or fashion, He's gifted everyone. Some maybe in greater capacity, if we would think of it this way, than even others. But we also have to understand that no matter what you may think about your calling of how great or how insignificant it may seem, I want to tell you it's very, very important. Every gift, every person, no matter who you are and no matter how you may feel about what your calling is, it is very important. It is very significant in the kingdom of God, especially when we look at it in light of the body of Christ. So you have purpose, and there is a purpose that is within you. Now I want to go back and I want to share something because most of the time when we think of the church, if we make mention, and we, will, we, we do this, and uh, I do the same thing, we're going to church. Yeah, or we, where do you attend church at? And we'll, we'll make reference to a building. Uh, and we want to put an address on this. And I want to say this this afternoon, and it, may the Spirit of the Lord help me here. That when we think of the church, we think of something that's called a brick and mortar building. Something that's made out of wood or nails. A place where we go to assemble together. But the church is not this building that we're in. The church is not this. We can abandon this church and they can put a warehouse here. But the church will no longer be here. Why is that? Now, some bystanders or bypassers may look back and refer to it. Hey, that used to be the church. Or that used to be an old church building. But this could be a warehouse, could be anything. 
Is this still a church? No, it's not. As a matter of fact, we can abandon and still leave the name on the front and the steeple on the top. But if the congregation leaves, the church leaves. And this becomes just a building, a brick and mortar building. And I want us to grab a hold to this because the church is you. You are the church. You are. You are the vessel. You are the temple of God. So when we look at it in this manner, is the church is not the building, but it's the people. A redeemed people who is the body of Christ. So we're the body of Christ. Of Christ. When God does something, He uses this body. Amen. Are you with me here? When God does something, He uses this body. You're going to find out when you begin to, don't let me get off a of base here long, okay? But I'm fixing it what my dad would call get on a rabbit trail, just one second. When you look at the, we call the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light, I refer to it in them manners. And we have, when we look at it in this manner, if the devil's going to do anything, he does it through people, through possession, through activities there. And it's the same way concerning the kingdom of God. When God gets ready to do something, he's using people. He's using me and you. And so we are the body of Christ. We are the vehicle. We are the instrument in which God is using to carry the gospel. And I'm going to say, to the, not only to the world, but to your neighbor. To a community. We are that vehicle. So many times we're always praying, God, do something. And I think that sometimes we are waiting on God to do something and really, God's waiting on us to do something. Is anybody with me? We are that body. One of the greatest hindrances is not understanding, and we're talking about the body of Christ. One of the greatest hindrances is not understanding that I have a place in the body. That you have a place in the body. Let me stop right here again. You look around and you see ministries sometimes that are flourishing. You see them just flourishing. That didn't happen by one person. It didn't happen by two people. It happened by a unity of people playing their part in the body. You, 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 if you look at a football team, I know a lot of people like to address and point out the quarterback. But I want to tell you this, just as an analogy. You can, you can look at, you probably heard this phrase or this saying, Tom Brady versus whoever. And really it's not that way. Tom Brady versus the, the Kansas City Chiefs. Well, I want to tell you, in, realistically put Tom Brady on the field versus the Kansas City Chiefs, and he's going to lose every time. You ain't grabbing hope to this. He's going to need a center. He's going to need people to block. He's going to need receivers, and he's going to need running. He's going to need 10 more people on that field. He cannot do it by himself. And in the NFL, he ain't going to last long by himself. Am I, am I making a connection here? So the ministry was never intended for any, any specific part of it, or a ministry was never intended for a all the load to be put on one person. And if you do this, you're going to limit the ministry and what it's capable of doing. You're probably not, you're probably going to stay at an idle, stay at a standstill. 
I read something a couple weeks ago. It was something that was very alarming to me. And I had to go back and I just done a little bit of research. You know, I read what we would call fact checking. And my facts checking is going to Google and just Googling it up. So I don't know how, I don't know how, you know how accurate that is. <laughs> I've learned this from my, my boys, my kids. When I'd have a question, and this is before I even come even a little, I, I'm not tech savvy at all. And they'd say, well, just Google it up. I said, what you mean? Just, just Google it up. And what I've come to find out, you can find out about everything you want to. Just Google it up. And I seen where a, a guy, a pastor made a statement that in the year 2022, 17,000, could have been, seven, I think it was 17,000, might have been 1,700 pastors left the ministry. And that has continued to be a revolving door. Do you, there was a time in my life I've got so frustrated and I, I've suffered burnout. Lord, help me here. And this was the reason why. This is the reason pastors are leaving the ministry just by the thousands or hundreds. It's because now the pastor is taken or the, the church has placed all the load on him and wanted him to be everything. This is evident even in our ministry that you can look around today and you see ministries just dying. There is ministry, not only, not only are pastors leaving the ministry, there was just as many churches had closed their doors in the last year. Might have been more than preachers had that quit. They said, you can just go look this up. It's just, the statistics is out there. What happens is so many times we have not understood our place in the kingdom of God. Amen. That we're not a one-man show or a one-woman show. We are the body of Christ. Amen. We are the body of Christ. And when you look into this, when we look at this, I said that the, our greatest hindrance is this. And I've heard these comments that have been made that as soon as we hire, hire a pastor in, that all of a sudden now, since we're paying you something, that now we saying, you do what everybody else has been doing since we're paying you to do this. And it sounds, hey, you know what? We look at it, and then most of the church would say, I've been, in, I've been in meetings. I've been in meetings when I wasn't the pastor. And they would say, hey, what do you expect out of me? We expect you to do everything. Then all of a sudden, this church becomes stagnant. Do you see where I'm coming from? Because this pastor's not gifted in every area. He's only gifted in a few. I would tell you right now, I'm, there's a lot of things I can't do. And I've, I, over the years, I've tried to identify them, and that's why I'm trying to pray, God, you need to send me some help because I, there's some things I'm really terrible at. And I can't do this. And if I try to do them, I find out that I'm making a mess out of it. And, with, and you would do the same thing. And with a sincere heart, now you're struggling trying to make something happen. Then you can't do it because you're not good at this. And you get discouraged. You know what you say? I'm going to the house. Because now the rest of the church is saying, why ain't you? You need to do a better job at what you're doing. And you're thinking the whole time, I'm really not even called to do this. I don't know why I'm even here. Does this make sense? Do you see how this frustration starts to set in? I don't know why nobody, well, I do know why nobody ever dresses these things because I ain't dressed them for years because of the backlash. The backlash of when we leave here, Pastor, we need to meet with you. And we want you to know we hired you for a specific thing. And it's not to call us out as members. We're here, we're paying you to do these things for us. I want you to understand the heart of any ministry needs to be the expansion of the kingdom of God. Amen. And I would believe 
that being a born again redeemed of the Lord, there is a commission to go into the world to declare the gospel. And I would think that a reflection of my passion for the kingdom would be to get involved in God's work, in kingdom work. Do you see this? There ain't a person in here that have a business or have worked for a business that didn't have multiple employees that work there. They have different people that do all kind of different jobs. One person didn't do everything. The reason that business was successful because they had put people in place who was good at doing accounting work. There was people who was good at sitting down behind a typewriter. There was people or a keyboard now. I'm way out there now. <laughs> And, and they was good at specific things. One person did not do everything. And the, the, the orchestrator, the boss man, had understood if this ministry or this business is to go forward, we've got to put the right people in place. And everybody's got to do their job. And when they do their job, this thing starts to run like a fine-tuned machine. Am I making sense? So when you go begin to look, and I want to encourage you to go to read the rest of chapter 12. Because he makes mention here about the kingdom of God. Let me share one more thing. And I, I, I really like this. I, I met the other day with a couple. I'm not going to call their name out here with me right now. But uh, I met with them the other day, and, and uh, he had told me, he says, we're no spectators. And I'm like, I already done fell in love with you. In other words, we're not here to watch. Thank he told me, he says, we come to get in the game. When you go to a ball game, most of the time, and this is what I found out. You, you find these things out by going to certain things. You find these things out just by living life. There's very few participators and a lot of spectators. But the spectators is always the one doing the booing and always complaining about what is being done or how things are done, but yet refuse to get involved. I've never really understood that. You know what I mean? I've never really understood that. God's not called you to be a spectator. He's called us to be participators in the kingdom of God. Amen. Now, hey, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to throw this out. I'm very, very fortunate to be at West Thailand with so many participators. I just feel blessed, you know what I mean? When you move over into 1 Corinthians, it starts to form a picture of a body. And it begins to make mention when you get to verse 4. 15. Can I read this just a second? He said, if the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not the body? The question mark. And if the ear shall say, because I am not the, the eye, I am not the body, is it therefore not the body? If the whole body were an eye, where, where would the hearing be? If the whole were hearing, where would the smelling? But now God has set members, every one of them, in the body as it pleased him. I believe that the involvement in the kingdom of God is a reflection of our passion to the kingdom of God. So we ask a question, and we ask this question, how many want to be involved or is concerned about the kingdom of God and is concerned about, God, I want to do my part in the kingdom of God? I would think that, man, but you would think that there should be an overflow that I'm really passionate, I'm really concerned about the kingdom of God. Your concernment should be reflected in your involvement. Because it's going to be hard to say that I'm concerned about the body and which way we're going, but yet you're just sitting back as a spectator. Does this make sense? 
So each one of us has a part. Now let me share something else. Because, how am I going to say this? Is as insignificant as you may think it is, it's not insignificant to the Lord nor to this body. It's important. Now I'm fixing to paint you a picture, okay? Are you with me? Have I got y'all's attention tonight? I'm going to paint you a picture. I started to use an illustration, but I'm not too good at illustration, you know. And I started to do this, and I started to bring me up about six people. And I started to say, hey, you're, when one person comes up, you're the leg. And the other person comes up, you're the leg. And the other person comes up, and you're the body. And the other person comes up, and you're the arm. And you're the other arm. And I tell the two legs to sit down, but yet I tell the body, we want to go from here to that door back there. You can't do it. You can't do it without the legs. Is anybody with me? Or if the legs want to participate and yet we get to where we want to go and yet we got to move something and we look around the arm and says, we, don't, we just didn't show up today. We didn't feel like it. This is not important to us. Let y'all take care of it. Then all of a sudden say, well, how are we going to be able to move this from here to there unless we have some arms? Am I connecting? Do you see now how the body comes together? And how every part begins to play a very, very important part. Then when one part is not functioning, or one part is not in the game, has chosen to be a spectator, all of a sudden now the body is hindered to what it can do. You with me? I was, I was uh, talking to a pastor today. And they was talking about a new work that was going to be done. A church trying to revamp it and get it back to going. And, and my concern, this is what I laid on the table. I says, first of all, we must pray very specifically about the pastor that is there, that they have vision for this ministry. But this was my next question. I says, do we have anybody in place to help this guy? And nobody ever even thought about that. No, we thought he, we would just send him in there and he would try to get out. I said, this man needs help. Go back to this. This man can't come in. He can't lead the songs. He can't do the piano playing. He can't do all this right by himself. He's going to need help. If you're going to not only continue with a ministry or start a ministry, you're going to need some members, some people in place, somebody to, to help you. If not over time, you're going to find out, man, this pastor's now went through burnout and these things right here, and he's frustrated. The reason he's frustrated is because he was trying to do things he was never called to do. Does this make sense? So it's important that every, every person is doing that which God has called them to do. And I'm going to stress this again. Regardless of how insignificant it may seem to you, it's very important to the body. Amen? Do you see this picture? God has gifted you. God has placed something on the inside of you. I want to close with this little story. I won't take long on this. There was a parable in the book of Matthew, chapter 25, and it starts in verse 14. And it talks about a parable of talents. You all remember this? Just read it. Powerful passage of Scripture. Powerful. That the Lord had brought some servants in, and this word talent is really actually just translated money, just a change of money. And he give one five talents, he give one, was it two talents and one one talent. 
And this is what he said. He said, I want you to do business until I come occupy. Do business. Take that which I have given to you and do the work of the kingdom. Work with what I have placed in your hands. And so when he comes back, the guy that had five talents, and I would say it's just three people, five, I'm going to say, hey, he was at the top of the chain. You know what I mean? And what we have there, he had five talents. And when the, when the Lord come back, he addressed the man. He said, hey, I need to see you. Uh, come into my office, as they would say, used to say, we need to come up to the carpet. You know what I mean? Y'all probably ain't never heard that, have you? <laughs> that means you're going to the big man's office. And he, the Lord brought him in, and he says, when I left, I give you five talents. I want to know what have you done with the five talents since I've been gone. And this man says, I took the five talents that you give me, and I multiplied them, and I doubled them. I got ten now. And the Lord made comment to him, well done, thy good and faithful servant. Well, he, he, he looked at the guy who had two talents. This guy does not even have half as many as the first one, but he has two. And when he comes, the Lord asked him, says, I need to find out what have you done with the two talents that I give you. Doesn't look like a whole lot. But I want to tell you this, it was enough that the Lord was concerned what he had done with this. And the man says, I took the two talents that you give me. Said, I went and I have increased them and gained two more. So actually, he'd done the same thing that the man with five talents done. He had doubled them. Then it comes to the guy who has won. I want you to watch this. And I think one talent, very, please grab a hold of this, very insignificant amount if we would look at it. I'm just talking about when you're looking at it from the natural, who cares about one talent? Who cares about that? Who's keeping up with one? It's really not that important. It's not worth a whole lot. And when the Lord came back, he said, I just need to, just need, I'm just doing inventory. And he said, I need to find out what did you do with the one talent that I give you? Now, I want to say this because this to me is just so powerful. And it says a lot within itself. Because so many times we think because our talent is insignificant, it's not important. Are you with me? Because our talent is not very significant, it's not important. But when the Lord looked at him, he said, what did you do with the one? And this is what the man said. He said, I knew that you were a hard man, that you reap where you did not sow. He said, so this is what I've done with my talent. I went and I hid it. I buried it. And I thought to myself, he put more effort into hiding his talent than he would have if he had just went and done something with it. Are you with me? You probably worked around people on the job. They just run from the job all day long. I thought to myself, my Lord, you wore out from just trying to hide from work. You should have just went ahead and worked. <laughs> this man's confession was judging him. Because if I ask you today, is God concerned about what talent he's given you, even though if it's one? And you would probably say, oh, yeah, he's probably concerned. Then my next question would be, if you think that he's really concerned about this, why are you hiding it? Why did you bury it? And so the, the Lord said this. Y'all still with me? The Lord said this. 
He said the least you could have done, the very least, is took the one talent and went and put it in the bank where it would have drawn interest. Now, I thought about this. Now, I can't bring all this stuff off the top of my head because it's been a while since I studied on this. But this talent was very, very little. Very little. And being put in a bank just to draw interest would have drawn very, very little. Y'all still with me? And this is what this is what I got from this. The Lord wasn't expecting a whole lot, but he was expecting something. Are you with me? You just had one. I wasn't expecting a whole lot, but at the minimum you could have done was at least put it in the bank. It might not have would have doubled itself, but it would have gained something. I wasn't expecting much, but I was expecting something out of you. And I'm going to tell you something else that's very powerful in this, this passage because the Lord never used these words but just a couple of times in the Scriptures for he called a man this. And he looked at the man and he said, you are wicked. Stay with me here. I was riding in the road this week thinking about this passage, thinking about this. I don't know if you keep up with me. on. Uh, you can go on uh, West Highlands page and you can see what I'm studying on all the time. And I tell you here in Corinthians. And boy, I'm just thinking and meditating upon this. And I thought about this. The Lord said, if you're not for me. Wow, if you're not for me, you're against me. I didn't say that. And, and that, that hit me like a ton of bricks. I said, because now there is no position to be neutral. Do you see this? There's no position to say, I'm just going to be a spectator. That's when I grabbed onto that. And I said, Lord, if I am not working for you, I'm working against you. If I'm not involved in the kingdom of God and working with you, I'm working against you. My position of neutral is not for you. And if I'm not for you, Jesus has declared that I was against him. So he is declaring to the body to, for us to be involved in the kingdom of God and that is a reflection. Lord, we're working for your kingdom. We're working for your kingdom. We're here to expand your kingdom. Amen. There is a great calling in your life. God has gifted you God has gifted us and the ones that's watching us by social media here tonight that has been involved in a church somewhere and you're just sitting at home doing nothing, I encourage you, get involved in the body of Christ and do your part. There's ministries all across this land that are desperate. It cannot move forward because they're missing limbs, they're missing legs, they're missing arms. And, and these, we're just sitting on the couch watching like, like somebody at a buffet, feed me, feed me. And God is declaring and crying out, get involved in the kingdom of God. Amen. Glory to God. I want you to stand. Y'all have me preaching all night tonight.